Okay. Blog Talk Radio. <laughs> but not broken with host Patrick Scroggins. As a U.S. Army attack helicopter pilot deployed in Iraq, Patrick faced a devastating crash, which resulted in him dying, losing a leg, and a slew of broken bones. Patrick's story of rehabilitation has helped others to overcome their own obstacles. Each week, Patrick recounts stories of inspiration and interviews guests who have overcome remarkable obstacles. This is Wounded But Not Broken with your host, Patrick Scroggins. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Wounded But Not Broken. Uh, tonight, uh, I want to start off by uh, talking about, uh, um, you know, our hearts and our prayers go out to the Colin Palace family. It's uh, such a tragedy to lose a, a hero like that, a man that you know, gave most of his adult life uh, for this country. Uh, you know, so our hearts and prayers definitely are with his family tonight. And, uh, you know, hopefully they uh, they get through all the sadness uh, as easy as possible. Uh, tonight's show uh, is, is uh, it's another touching show of uh, selfless selflessness and sacrifice. Tonight we have uh, Anthony Marquez. He's going to be on the line telling his story and telling what he's doing uh, to pay it forward for uh, wounded veterans. So welcome, Anthony. Hey, thank you for having me. It's good to be on. Yeah, man. Thanks for thanks for showing up and thanks for giving an hour of your time tonight for us. Uh, hey, so let's just dig right in into this. So, how did you uh, how did you decide to join the Marine Corps and just walk us uh, quickly through you know your you know being a Marine and what it takes and and uh, the things that you did. Um. So, just as at a young age, you know, growing up, uh, my one of my role models. You know, even when I was six years old, was my uh, uncle, and my uncle was in the Marine Corps back in the early '80s. Um, he did an enlistment in the Marine Corps and was in Japan, all that stuff, in a tanker unit. And so, just always growing up, I used to be like, he'd give me GI Joes, and like, always, I would always just be playing like Army or whatever. And uh, so he was, he was the big influence and the reason that I joined the Marine Corps. So coming out of high school, and when between my junior and senior years, when I actually joined the Marine Corps. Um, I did the uh, the pulley function, the delayed entry program, um, and then I went into the Marine Corps 11 days after I graduated high school. So it was just something I always wanted to do as a kid. Um, both my grandfathers also served, so that played played a important uh, you know reason of why. Uh, my grand my one grandfather who's still alive, he lives four miles from me. He was a a World War II veteran and a Korean vet- uh, War veteran. Um, so <clears throat> I'm kind of the one. In the current conflicts, I'm the only one in my immediate family or even distant relatives that have been in the military. So, but yeah, just kind of a childhood dream and then something that I felt like I should do because a lot of people I look up to have done it as well. Yeah, so it just sounds like a long lineage of uh, of your family's been in in the core. And you know, I know I know you guys in the core. I mean, it's you know, it's it's pretty impressive to see the. uh, you know, the camaraderie. I mean, that's in all the military services, but especially yeah. before, I mean, it's, uh, it's just kind of a big extended family at the same time. Yeah. yeah. So what, what was your MOS? Um, I was an 0311. I was a grunt. So I joined, uh, I did, I had a five year active duty contract. Um, I joined, um, and I, so I went to boot camp in 07 and I got out in 2012, but my MOS was uh, 0311 infantry. But I did a program called the uh, Security Forces. So, so you do three years with Security Forces, and I was with uh, fast teams during that time. And then you PCS from that unit, and you go to your line platoon, and that's where I went to uh, First Battalion, Fifth Marines in 2010, and then I went to Afghanistan with them in 2011. Gotcha. So, to get into that program, is that something special you had to apply for, or is it uh, <clears throat> is it just Kind of um, no, so it's it's just kind of how recruiters do, you know. They like sweet talking and kind of picking a job. Um, so it was it, it seemed like something that was a little bit more than just a grunt. Um, it was still a grunt billet or or MOS, but you just go do security forces first. So security forces is also made up of two different elements. Uh, so you have fast teams, and then you also have like 
the teams who guard the nuclear weapons on nuclear plants. Um, so I didn't go that route. I didn't go to Kings Bay, Georgia, or anywhere like that and do like security on nuclear weapons. I went to the they call them fast teams, fleet anti-terrorism security teams. And what it is is kind of a glorified name to do like uh, we're trained in like quick reaction force uh, for embassies. Um, so when we deploy, we there's usually there's six fast teams that are deployed around the country, and there there'll be some in Japan, uh, Bahrain, and then Rota, Spain. Those are the three areas that, and there'll be two fast te- uh, fast platoons at each uh, location. And so you're a quick reaction force in that area of the world that that you're in charge of for M- uh, U- U.S. embassies. So, gotcha. So did you? Uh, so you said in 2010. So when did you deploy? Um, so I did, and I always explain this to people because <laughs> some of the Marines that I know they're like those weren't deployments. But uh, so I did two non-combat deployments with fast security forces. I went to Cuba in uh 08 with them and then uh and then 2009 to 10 i went to Rota, spain for nine months and we forward deployed deployed from there to israel and traded with the israelis for a little bit and back to Rota, finished that deployment came back to the states i pcs uh permanent change of station uh through fast teams and then i went to uh first time fifth marines on the west coast at camp pendleton um in may of 2010 and then for about a little bit less than a year until February 2011 was pretty much uh, our workup. We call it. We you're doing a workup for deployment. So, and then we went to Afghanistan, uh, staying in Afghanistan, in uh, end of March until October 2011. Gotcha. So on the on the uh, non-combat deployments per se, what what was your what did you all do? Like how did that deployment wrap up for you? Um, so the Cuba one, we were in charge of standing post on the border of the Gitmo and the Cuban side. Um, so they call them CASAs, Cuban Asylum Seekers. And we just – you'd pretty much stand post for a week, and then you're off a week training, and the other security team, the FAST team, would would go before you, and then you would become like the, the quick reaction force on on Gitmo for the, for the, board, uh, the, the fence line. Um, so that one was pretty simple. Obviously, it's just standing post for a week, and then you're off training for a week. And then you get some libo in the evenings, but still you can't you can't leave Gitmo. Um, then so that was like that was only three months. And then we uh, the one when you went we went to Road to Spain. Um, we just do a lot of training. Pretty much you get the weekends off, you get the evenings off, unless you're in the field at the time. Uh, you can go into town, um, but you got to be back by a certain time. Uh, so those ones they you know they're non combat but you're still out there doing stuff you're still whatever the, you know that that billet is that job that you're required to do you're still out there doing it and like we we got we got spun up and almost went to Yemen when we were there once for uh, because the embassy in Yemen was having some issues in 2010 or 9 I think it was 10 and but then we got stand stood down for that but uh so you're just kind of kind of like the military hurry up wait kind of thing you're waiting around for something to happen right there hear you so uh, then, you know, after that, I, you you deployed to Afghanistan in '11, right? Yeah. So um, yeah, we were. So I was a dog handler. So I was a grunt, and the Marine Corps had this program called the IDD, Improvised Explosive Detector Dogs. <clears throat> and so what they did is they would select a grunt from one line platoon from, or from each line platoon, and then and they would send you to the schoolhouse, and you'd be trained to uh, work. Uh, a, a, a single purpose odor only dog um, and then you came back to that platoon as the platoon dog handler so I was an 0311 grunt but I had not really a, a attached billet but I had an attachment of a dog with me and so the dog handlers were the last ones to leave the states to go to Afghanistan and then we were also the last ones to come back from Afghanistan because we had to fly on um, a cargo plane like a big cargo plane with Connex boxes and stuff like that so we could put our kennels and with the dogs and everything inside there Gotcha. What kind of and what kind of dog was it? What, what was it, what was your dog's name? I know it's pretty famous, and but a lot of people don't know. I, I mean, I know the story, but what was the yeah. dog's name? My dog's name was Allie, and actually, Allie was the second dog I had. I had a dog before her, her and his name was Gator, and uh, I had him in the schoolhouse. He was like the best dog, and then we went to do some training on a workup, and we went into this mount town and started taking gunfire and uh, simulated the uh, IED explosion, and then the dog just ran off. And was, 
there was a base wide search for this dog and they found him snagged on a fence and he ended up having some issues from prior deployment so they replaced him with Allie and I got Allie in January 2011 when we were at um, uh, Mojave Viper which is a big training Phoenix that the Marine Corps does before they send uh, units uh, into country to go on deployments. Gotcha. Yeah, I don't. I think a lot of people don't understand that. It's it's you know it's kind of insensitive for a lot of people. But the dogs they they get PTSD really bad as well um, from, from yeah. deployments. And yeah. It, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's it's a tough it's a tough thing. I mean, you know, because the dog gets so connected with you as the handler and even the guys you're working with. Right. And, you know, I mean, I'm, yeah. I know that you had a really rough deployment, uh, with a bunch of your friends and, and a lot of that stuff. I don't know, uh, you know, how much you want to talk about that, but, um, you know, did, did that affect you in any way? Uh, and did it affect Allie? Um, yeah, it's, yeah. So I always tell people like when I talk about this, I'm like, well, deployment, like change, like the course of my life, like, the the life before I had or the person I was before I went to a combat and then like the life after is completely different. I'm, I'm a different person. All those experiences put me on a different path. Um, so yeah. Um, and so I was Allie's first handler and we thought she had three other handlers. So we thought she had four combat deployments, but now we're only thinking that she had three, so, but I've already been in contact with her other two handlers. So I know everything that happened between her and I on deployment, you know, what, what, what her and I went through together. But then um, I don't really know all the stories that the other guys had as well, but she was also, you know, deployed to combat zones as well, the other two handlers. Um, but yeah, it's, you know, com- I think, I think combat changes everybody differently, but it, it has, you know, put me on a different path since that time. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, when you're, when you're living with, you know, your guys and I mean, you, you know, you become brothers. I mean, it's just, it's such a, yeah. such a bond, such a bond that you yeah. form. And, you know, when, when you lose a guy, it's like losing a family member. I mean, uh, it's very yeah. difficult. It's, and so. It's rough. And yeah, it, it bothers a lot of people over the years, like, especially when you come home and you struggle with those issues. And, and even, uh, so it was three weeks ago, Friday. So just a little over three weeks ago, I got to adopt Allie in 2014, the dog that I had on the planet. Since I was the first handler, I got to adopt her. And about a little over three weeks ago, I had to have her put down. And um, I, I was telling Amos about this. Like, you know who Amos is, but uh, he was my squad leader in Afghanistan. He lives, stayed up for me. <clears throat> and I was like, it feels weird. Like, I feel like I'm losing one of the Marines again. Like, I, I felt the same way, like, when I, when one of the Marines was killed or something i felt that same way with Allie when because i had to make the decision well her health is declining so i had to make the decision the day before we actually had her put down and i told him i was like it's rough like i feel like i'm losing one of my friends like one of my good friends which she was a good friend of mine she was you know her and i went through a lot of horrible things together in that in that time of my life and her life as well in 2011 you know we were everything that altered the way my life in that time and over the last 10 years she was there for it so it was just i always knew that time would come but it was rough right and she she was a lab correct yeah so so during that program the marine corps they had they we used black labs and they're single purpose odor only so a lot of a lot of dogs like they'll use them they'll be dual purpose so they're a bite dog or a odor dog or stuff like that so she wasn't trained to be an aggressive dog she was just trained to like search for um, IEDs, uh, weapons cassés, and stuff like that. So she was trained on different types of odors that the Taliban were using at that time. Gotcha. When you all were deployed together, did she? Did they ever try to blow up an IED on her? No, they never did. Um, not not on her. But I've heard stories of things like that happening before. They try to bait the dogs in, and also like I was told before we even left. Afghanistan that there was a, a bounty on dog handlers and a bounty on dogs so because when you're a dog handler you're that t- you're it's kind of a tool you know you're using the dog as a tool so you're up towards the front uh, most of the time especially if you're using the dog you'll either be the second or the third man back and you'll be searching for that with that dog so and you're standing out there and it you know you these dogs are trained to be sent away from you and search things that are danger areas uh, things that are suspicious. So, but but the way that you actually 
use the dog is you have a whistle and you have to use hand and arm signals and speak. So, you know, you're in a combat zone, you're standing out there and your dog's out there searching a, a car or a ditch. And you're over there blowing this whistle and like moving to the side and throwing your arms in the air. So, I mean, it kind of makes you a target, you know, <laughs> they know who you are. And so right. we were told that there was a bounty on the dogs that if they were to catch the dogs and cut the dog's ears off that, and they would get paid for that. Um, and then also if they were to kill a dog handler, they would get paid for that as well. But Wow. Yeah, everybody, hey, we're going to take a break for a word from our sponsors. When we come back, you're going to hear more about Allie and Anthony's deployment and uh, what Anthony's doing uh, to help out wounded soldiers now and, and what he struggles with. So we'll be right back. Put your weapon next to mine. Put your weapon next to mine. You're listening to Wounded But Not Broken with host Patrick Scroggin. We will be right back after a word from our sponsors. My father was the, the best truck driver I've ever known in my life. Like a family tradition. I'm a truck driver myself. I drove around the state with my cat. To be the truck driver, you not just only see where you go, you see the world in the larger perspective. This is a really good time to be in the trucking industry. The dispatchers get good loads for them. The equipment is very new and then it's very reliable. At GTS Transportation, we make dreams come true by employing truck drivers, dispatchers, mechanics, and many other occupations. Consider joining our rapidly expanding team where we put quality, human dignity, and respect back into the workforce. Contact us by visiting our website at gtscarrier.com or call us at 847-754-4667. That number again, 847-754-4667. Dallas Corporation and Dallas Logistics, a proud supporter of the Veterans Radio Broadcast for over 15 years. High-quality printing services and warehouse distribution have been our hallmark since 1985, serving Fortune 100 companies for over 35 years. Check us out at www.dallascorp.com. CBN, Veterans Broadcast Network, brings you Wounded But Not Broken, hosted by Patrick Scroggin. It lies within you to conquer your greatest challenges. Patrick tackles the stories of how others faced unthinkable odds and then at a pivotal moment, a change occurred within them that gave them the strength, attitude, and direction to excel beyond the greatest expectations. Listen every week and learn how it is possible to defeat the impossible. Welcome back to Wounded But Not Broken with host Patrick Scroggin. All right, everybody, welcome back to Wounded But Not Broken. It's Patrick Scroggin here with Anthony Marquez, and we were talking about Allie. So, Anthony, um, in, in your deployment with Allie, like what was what was your typical day, and uh, did she find any IEDs, or were, did you all witness any uh, any getting blown up or anything like that? Um, so just our typical day would be uh, just going on foot patrols. Um, so originally I was with first squad, but so our platoon was made up of three squads. But uh, since I was the only dog handler for our whole platoon, um, it's just whoever, whatever squad wanted to take me out on patrol, they'd be like, hey, you want to go with us? And I'd be like, yeah, or hey, we're going to take you with us this time, okay? Um, but uh, so, and I always tell people, like, her and I actually never found anything, We were, and which is surprisingly, uh, but we were never on a patrol that anybody got, like, I, I told her, I always say that we never found anything, but we never missed anything either. Um, because nothing ever happened like after we walked by it, nobody was ever blown up behind me or whatever. And, um, so, and that's one thing too, that 
and I've kind of explained it to a few other people, but I'm like, that's kind of some things that uh, can kind of bother me at times because I feel like, well, if I would have been there, like maybe this wouldn't happen or we, this guy wouldn't have been killed or this guy wouldn't have been maimed, you know, lost limbs. Uh, right. So, so that that comes into the whole, like, you know, feeling guilty about some things and whatnot. But, um, yeah, but yeah, just I different mean, ways, just in a, yeah, combat zone going on foot patrols and, so. Yeah, that's 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 always tough because you know, you know, when you're not there with your guys and something does happen to them, you know, you always it's I always I always say that you know I call it the expendable soldier because you, it's like putting your hand in water and pulling it out everything kind of fills in but that's for the type A personality and and the and the infantry guys and the go getters it's really hard to comprehend that that the mission can still go on without you you don't ever want to believe it can yeah. but it absolutely can but when it does and something happens you wish you were there. It's it's yeah. uh, very hard to explain, but um, yeah. So were you there? Once. Were you there when Amos got blown up? Yeah. Um, so and I told Amos this a long time ago, but yeah, yeah. He's one of the one of them because I was asked to go on that patrol, and they were leaving late at night in the evening, and they were coming back in the morning, and they said, "Hey, you want to go with us?" And I was like, "Yeah, I'm gonna stay here. I'm gonna fucking sleep in my cot, you know, <laughs> instead of going to the OP and sleeping on the ground." And literally, like. Within 10 minutes of them leaving the uh, PB, uh, we heard the blast, and then initially we heard we heard it was another Marine named Brown. And um, so when they come in, like Brown comes walking in, and then we're like, you know, confused on who it was. And then that's when they told us that well, it was Amos, and he was the fourth man. From from my understanding, he was the fourth man back. So like, I was like, well, if I would have went, maybe I would have been the second or the third man back. And we would have been searching right. with Ali, you know, so – and I've talked to him about that a long time ago. Um, but, uh, yeah, so, yeah, I was there. I wasn't there, but I was right up the street, you know. I got gotcha. you. Yeah, Matt's going to – I'm going to have Matt on in a couple of weeks. But uh, so with uh, with that is, you know, how many friends have you lost? How many guys did you did you all lose in that, out of that uh, – out of your group? So out of my whole battalion, we had 17 Marines killed from – April 24th until September 15th. There were 17 Marines that were killed in that time frame. Um, and I was there when the very first Marine was loaded on the Hilo. Um, so he was, I was with 1st Platoon. He was with the uh, 3rd Platoon. And we, at that moment, like I was doing uh, mobile, so like in the trucks. And it was, it was Easter Sunday morning. April 24th at eight, a little after eight in the morning, uh, eight something in the morning. And we got the call that, uh, third platoon needed a medevac truck. So we went over there to pick them up. And by the time we got over there, they had already put them in the back of a pickup truck and drove them to the closest, uh, fob where the helo could come pick them up. So we went over to the fob and that's when, um, at the time it was Staff Sergeant Myers, um, who was third platoon, platoon sergeant. We roll in there and get out and, Ramirez and Cesar Myers were by the tent. The whole squad was kind of by the tent, and they were just like, "Don't go in there." And you can just see it on all their faces. Like that's, and I always say like, this is when like the whole war like became real to me because that was the moment that I first saw like got a taste of war. So they ended up, you know, the bird came in to pick him up, and they carried him by us, and he passed away. Um, but yeah, so he was on a patrol, a foot patrol, and he slipped, and he went to catch himself, and he put his left hand right on an IED. And so, uh, but anyway, yeah. So for so that was the very our very first one, and just the week prior to that, I was sitting on a sitting on a bed next to him, waiting for a ride over to uh, Wishtam, which was our patrol base, and watching a movie on a laptop with him. And then the next, you know, that next week he was he was killed and gone. Um, and then the last, then, so then during that whole period. It, from the 24th to the 15th of September, like we had uh, 17 Marines that were killed from my battalion and over 200 wounded. Wow. That's crazy. So, so your, your deployment was what about, a, about eight months? Um, it's really a little less than seven, I believe like okay. little, almost close to seven, six months. So even when the dog handlers, end- the, uh, so the dog handlers, we had to do an acclimation period. When we get to Afghanistan, we couldn't just – we were the last ones to get to Afghanistan. So by the time we got there, our unit had already been, been sent out to rip with 
and um, and then we, uh, the dog handlers, had to do a 10-day acclimation period so the dogs could get used to the weather, and then we got uh, our separate rides out there. Um, so, but anyway, so. Gotcha. So when uh, when you when it was time for you to come back, so how long after you came back from that did you did, when did you get out? I got out in March 2012. So we got back from Afghanistan 10 years ago tomorrow. Um, I just saw a post on my Facebook memories that 10 years ago today I was in Germany. We had just left Afghanistan. We were in Germany. And then so the ninth, October 19th, the dog handlers landed back in California. And when we landed, we actually – the company that trains the dogs, it's a civilian company. They were there at the airport. We, they loaded the dogs up, and they were gone. And I didn't think I would see Allie again, and it was about – Three years later, a little less than three years later, that I did actually see her again. I got to adopt her, but uh, yeah. So um, it was yeah. I got out just roughly it's like six, a little less than six months after getting back from Afghanistan. Gotcha. What do you think you struggled with the most uh, coming back from the war? Um, I don't know. I think it's a combination of a few things. You struggle with. I don't know. It's. Like I, 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 I guess I kind of had a drinking problem, and it kind of gotten worse over time, over a period of time. And just, and then when you do that, and you just, it like amplifies all your issues, so the, your the feelings you have it doesn't it doesn't make anything go away. Uh, but I, I just, like I said earlier, I struggled with some things like that happened on deployment and why I wasn't there, and why not. You know, I wish I could have been there. Maybe things could have been. You started playing the whole what if thing, the whole what if game. What if I would have been on right. that patrol? You know, instead of at the patrol base or instead of in a gun truck doing security for a, uh, a bulldozer, and then you you get a call over the radio that first first platoon had a you know two urgent surgicals, and you go over there and and uh, you know it comes to find out it's one of your good friends. But uh, so it's just stuff like that that. Yeah, I got you. I, yeah, I, I think, you it. know, I, I often say it's the, you know, for the most part, it's the wounds that you can't see or the worst wounds, right, for people because, you know, people, I mean, I look at you and, I mean, I know your story, but if I was a stranger looking at you, you know, you have all your limbs, you have everything, but the things that you've been through, the things that you've seen, how that it really affects your psyche and, you know, to come yeah. back. So that's like P- PTSD, right? And then And then you just, you go into the bottle trying to trying to drink that away. And then every, like you said, everything gets compounded. And before you know it, you're so deep into it that, you know, you gotta, you gotta call and fight to get out or, or get help. Right. Yeah. I think some of us forget, like, I don't know, like you gotta like live your life after these experiences. You know what I mean? You can't just like shut down or else you won't you ever get anywhere. Um, and it just takes some time. Sometimes it takes people a long time. Sometimes I don't know some people, and I'm not saying I'm not going to ever, struggle with issues it'll probably you know be a constant thing for the rest of my life like i said i'm on, on a different path now but you just and i i kind of explain it this way too is like as time goes on i matured and learned how to like deal with some of the things that i went through and so it becomes somewhat easier to you know live live your life right i mean so. it just it becomes your normal and so your normal yeah. has changed and you just, you learn how to deal with it. But, you know, some people don't have that ability and they need to get help. I mean, I'm kind of the same way. I, you know, there's a lot of things I think about, but at the end of the day, you know, I knew I was there for a purpose. I knew why I was there. I knew what could happen. And, you know, that's kind of what gets me through it. And, you know, there's times I get sad, you know, certain days and certain memories, but, you know, you just, yeah. you just kind of, kind of power through it because if you don't do that, you know, what What justice are you doing your buddies that didn't get to come home, you know? They would give anything mm-hmm. to be where I'm at, so it'd be hard for me yeah. to gripe about my, my situation, you know? Yeah. I Yeah. It's, but, um, yeah. Yeah, so what do you think uh, when you got back, like, activities-wise, what do you think helped you to kind of kind of mend it? You know, because everybody has their, their you know, certain things what they, they like turn to do. To, or their, yeah. yeah, their healing um, process. So – when I got out of the Marine Corps, um, I, I was like, you know, into lifting weights heavily, and I started doing like powerlifting, and I got into that, and started to kind of compete in that in that realm as well. Um, but then I got bit by a tick in 2000, 2000, uh, what was it, 2013, like a year after I got out of the Marine Corps, and got really sick off that, and like my powerlifting kind of went downhill. Um, 
but I still – what I'm getting at is I, I turned to, like, weightlifting, and that was, like, one of my outs, uh, weightlifting. And then I also do, like um, – I taught myself how to weld and build, you know, build stuff. I built my own motorcycle, my own rat rod. So that was kind of something that I took that – I, that I would do to take my mind off things. I would work out, and I would, you know, build my own rat rod or, you know, and go to car shows with my rat rod that I built. And, um, but then in 2015, I got into skydiving. A friend of mine who was in the Marine Corps as well, he got me into skydiving, and I've been doing that now for six and a half years, and that's a big outlet for me that I, I turn yeah, to as a form of therapy. I know you love to do that. So, but hey, we're going to take a break and a uh, word from our sponsors here, and when we get back, we're going to go back into the recovery process and how Anthony and I met uh, through a great organization. So we'll be right back after a word from our sponsors. You're listening to Wounded But Not Broken with host Patrick Scroggins. Looking for semi drivers nationwide? GTS Transportation of Burr Ridge, Illinois is looking to hire a partner with experienced CDL holders in every state. If you are going to drive, why not drive for the best? Whether you are driving solo, as a team, or as an owner operator, GTS is looking to add you to their rapidly growing company. Become part of one of the most respected, driver friendly, and successful transportation companies in America where drivers are treated as royalty. Contact us at gtscarrier.com. Again, gtscarrier.com. Or call us at 847-754-4667. That number again, 847-754-4667. We would love to help you, which in turn helps everyone. GTS is an equal opportunity employer. Dallas Corporation and Dallas Logistics, a proud supporter of the Veterans Radio Broadcast for over 15 years. High quality printing services and warehouse distribution have been our hallmark since 1985, serving Fortune 100 companies for over 35 years. Check us out at www.dallascorp.com. CBN. Veterans Broadcast Network brings you Wounded But Not Broken, hosted by Patrick Scroggin. It lies within you to conquer your greatest challenges. Patrick tackles the stories of how others faced unthinkable odds and then at a pivotal moment, a change occurred within them that gave them the strength, attitude, and direction to excel beyond the greatest expectations. Listen every week and learn how it is possible to defeat the impossible. Welcome back to Wounded But Not Broken with host Patrick Scroggin. Welcome back, everybody. All right, we were Anthony and I were talking about kind of how you deal with the kind of the place you go to and the things you go to to help deal with some of the uh, the stresses and memories from uh, bad memories from combat. And so one of the things that uh, Anthony likes to do, he's a big skydiver, and this is kind of a great I- introduction to kind of how we met. Uh, also, he's an avid outdoorsman, as am I. And so I had the opportunity uh, three years ago, I think, right, Anthony, to present you at that hunt at the sheep show. Yeah, it was 2019. Yeah, it was yeah, it was three years ago. Yeah, three years ago. So um, uh, we both uh, have been really involved uh, trying to help veterans and uh, with Wounded Warrior Outdoors. It's a great organization. Uh, they get soldiers back into the into the wilderness, and it's uh, you know they get together and they cut up, and uh, it's it's just such a great organization. And that's that's how we met. I I um, through Ron. I uh, I gave you that hunt. Uh, on stage there at the sheep show that was pretty special that was you you weren't yeah, expecting it either were you <laughs> no no that was that was a crazy night i did not expect any of that yeah so and you also very, surprised yeah so did you you end up going that hunt right uh no i haven't gone on the hunt yet because of uh, all the stuff with covid that happened oh yeah because it was it, yeah it was given it was given to the hunt was given to me that cheap show, and then the next year COVID hit, and then this past year, 
so it was two years ago, like a little over two years ago. Um, the the traveling was still uh, like on hold or whatever. So it's it's I'm still slated to go. That's what I was told, but uh, it's just everything still kind of on hold. Yeah, you'll get to go. New Zealand's awesome. That's where you're going, right? New Zealand, if I remember correctly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and Zion's yeah, gonna, gonna be, be awesome. on that one. So. Right. Yeah, it, it, they'll 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 honor it still, just whenever you can go. But so I know Anthony, you got into doing uh you know doing your own thing. I I remember that was the first time that I really saw uh, your carving. Uh, they had it there at the sheep show. So can you kind of explain yeah. that to us? And I know your brother's going to join us here in a minute to talk about uh you know, what you all are, are doing uh, for veterans and to kind of help push everything forward. But can you talk a little bit about your, uh, how you got into carving and, and doing that kind of stuff yeah. and explain, explain how you do it? Yeah. So, um, um, so in 2016, I was driving a U-Haul truck to Florida and I got a message on Facebook through somebody, um, that was a friend of the family of one of the Marines that was killed. And she told me that, uh, that one of the gold star mothers attempted suicide. And, uh, so like, I felt like super, I felt like I was failing the families in that moment. Like I felt really bad. I'm like, well, I deal with my own issues. I haven't been really in contact with the gold star families that much. And I felt like I was failing them. So I, like I said earlier, I, I taught myself how to weld, and, like built my own rat rod motorcycle and stuff like that. So I just, uh, I was like, I wonder if I could do this image. It was battlefield cross, the rifle helmet boots, the memorial piece for a fallen service member <clears throat> out of wood uh, with a chainsaw and um, started looking for a chainsaw carvers in Oklahoma. Found a guy in Muskogee, Oklahoma named Clayton Koss. Um, come to find out he's like the best carver in Oklahoma and known all over the country and has been carving for over 30 years. And him and I did the first one together and I drove it and delivered it to my friend's mother on the fifth anniversary of his death. And then from there, I told myself, I was like, well, I need to do it for all the families. I need to do it for all 17 families. So then I started it's not really a company, but it's, it's my name. I, it's 17 carvings, and I've done and delivered one of the memorial carvings to all 17 of the families across the country. And um, so that's that's how I got involved with the carving uh, with carvings. It was the whole reason to give back to the Gold Star families. And um, you know, Barry Switzer is a good friend of mine. Um, he actually helped me get Allie back in 2014 when I adopted her. And when I started doing these carvings in 2016, he got involved in that as well, and he helped raise quite a bit of money. And I used those funds to go on the road to do a delivery, do a carving delivery to one of the families. Um, but he's getting involved now with the film that we're doing. Um, but, yeah, so Amos knew obviously what I was doing with my carvings, and that's how I really got involved with uh, Wounded Warrior Outdoors. Um, he asked right. me. If I would, yeah, if I would bring a carving to Orlando for their event, um, and I took one in 2018 to Orlando, and it auctioned off for 25,500 with the proceeds going to the organization, so they could take you know wounded vets on hunts. And then the very next year, they asked me if I'd bring one to Reno, Nevada, to the sheep show, and that one, that's that's the one that you saw um, at the event, and that one went for 25,000. And then I took one last year, 2020. January of 2020 to the sheep show again and went for 14. So that's what, um, that's how I got involved with WWO. I know, you know, it's a great organization like Ron and Lisa and, um, and then Amos, Amos is the reason that I was brought on with, uh, WWO, but yeah, I just went to Alaska with them back in August, um, which was an awesome trip. Yeah, but it was, man. Yeah. I mean, the WWO is just, I mean, it is the military, you know, Ron has yeah. created such a, such a great uh, organization there and guys get together and it's a brotherhood. And so, uh, yeah. you know, that's just, that's one of the, the non, the nonprofits, the good ones that, that do it for the right reasons are just, you know, invaluable yeah. to, uh, to soldiers, but yeah, your carvings are amazing, man. And, and, uh, you know, that's just, uh, I salute you for, for doing that and raising that kind of money. And, and, you know, that's, that's so selfless of you to, to take your time and, and do that for each, each of the 17 service members that died you know, in, in your group. Yep. And that's, that's awesome. You should be, you should be happy that, you know, that's, I, I don't know. That's just, to, yeah. I, I just spoke to one of the gold star fathers the other day, like last week on the phone. And this is the first time I spoke to him since 2017, because we're fixing to go on the road for our film, which we'll go into here in a minute. But, um, you know, I, I told him, I was like, I don't say this to be like bragging, but I take very, I, I take great pride in what, was done with the carvings and how I presented one to all the all of you guys and like it was very hard to like do that because um, I stood at all all the Marines graves and I presented 
uh, carving to each of the Gold Star families. And then in a way, that was like one of the hardest things I've ever done in my life, like had to do that um, because, you know, their son is no longer here and I was standing there with them. And so it was just I, I told him I was like, I take pride in, in have, being able to have done that. Um, and it took me about three years, just under three years to do, but I delivered my first carving and july 2016 and i delivered the 17th out of the 17 um on um just like four days before memorial day uh 2019 so just under three years but i've done i've done i've done 69 of my memorial carvings that uh i've given to all the other families and i've done them for other veterans other uh, gold star families other organizations and whatnot so and that's awesome. I hope you I hope you continue to do that. I know that it has to be uplifting. But let's go ahead. Let's bring Manny on. Let's bring your brother on, and let's let's get into this uh, the show that you all are doing or the film that you all are doing. Okay. Hey, how's it going? Um, so, hey, what's up, Manny? Hi. Thanks for having me on. Oh, thanks for being here. So, uh, Anthony or Manny, whichever one, do you all want to just just how you got into this and and what you're trying to accomplish with it? Um, so I'll, I'll kind of I'll kind of I'll introduce him. So my brother, he's my older brother, um, and he actually went to school for all this he, in the late '90s, and he lived on the West Coast for the last twenty-something years, and he's worked in that industry of filmmaking for that long. Um, so in 2017, when I did the delivery to Joe Jackson's family, which I spoke about him, he was killed on Easter, uh, Easter Sunday morning. Um, Joe Jackson. Uh, Joe Jackson's family lives in Yakima, Washington, and, and at that time, my brother lived in Hood River, Oregon, which was about 120 miles. So I flew out to Oregon, and my brother and I and uh, one of his friends, Jesse, we all um, went went to uh, the mountains in Washington, picked up a log, um, the whole process. We filmed the whole process from getting the log, doing the carving, and then the presentation. And then we made – I asked my brother if he would put together a short video – for uh, the, I was going to be on the halftime show for the Oklahoma Texas game uh, with Barry Switzer and his co co host, um, a show they do on Cox. And so Manny put together this short video and we played that. And uh, so, but he can talk about what we're doing now off of that and what, what we've done with that film as well and what, what we're going to do here in the future. Um, so he can go ahead and talk about that. Yeah. So, as Anthony said, I've been in filmmaking now for well, if you, since I was about 12 years old, but professionally since since I was about 20, and I'm 42 now. But um, made a couple of documentary films, and and um, and one of those films was called Operation Alley, which Anthony's already talked about his dog Alley. But um, when he set out to adopt a dog, we set out to make a short film of of that kind of them reuniting, and that's when he met um, Coach Switzer and. And I was there for all of that. And then um, a year later, he was doing the thing with the carving, and he came out to Oregon. And um, my buddy, Jesse Larvick, and I, we filmed that project and um, ended up making a five-minute short out of what was supposed to be just a little promo, like Anthony said, for the for the halftime show. Um, and it ended up being – we got nominated for best um, – or nominated for best short documentary film at, at the GI Film Fest in 2019 – um, we got nominated in 2016 with, with Operation Alley, too. So Anthony and I started talking, like, you know, we obviously have something with these films, and, and people are into the, what Anthony's doing and the work he's done, and um, we should we should make the feature. And, and part of what uh, Anthony and I have talked about is, like, for him, the 17 carvings were a way to honor the families and to, um, and to you know, honor the, the families that have lost their Marines and he wanted to acknowledge that loss in a way. And so the movie is kind of the, the end of that period, I think for Anthony and, and not to speak too you know, much for him, but I, I think in a way to put a period on that from his deployment to his, his time back and, and trying to move on to something else in his life. So what we're trying to do with the movie is revisit. It's not about the carvings because he's already done that. It's about him revisiting and honoring the memory of those Marines and, and honoring the loss that those families um, and their sacrifice that they've endured. And so by telling the, the story of those 17 Marines through the eyes of Anthony, that's kind of our goal in the movie. 
So Right, man, that that's awesome. Hey, we're going to take a, a quick break here from the word from our sponsors. When we come back, we're going to hear how, uh, more about this movie and how they're filming it and where they're filming it. So we'll be right back. You're listening to Wounded But Not Broken with host Patrick Scroggin. We will be right back after a word from our sponsors. My father was the, the best truck driver I've ever known in my life. Like a family tradition. I'm a truck driver myself. I drove around the state with my cat. To be the truck driver, you not just only see where you go, you see the world in the larger perspective. This is a really good time to be in the trucking industry. The dispatchers get good loads for them. The equipment is very new and then it's very reliable. At GTS Transportation, we make dreams come true by employing truck drivers, dispatchers, mechanics, and many other occupations. Consider joining our rapidly expanding team where we put quality, human dignity, and respect back into the workforce. Contact us by visiting our website at gtscarrier.com or call us at 847-754-4667. That number again, 847-754-4667. Dallas Corporation and Dallas Logistics, a proud supporter of the Veterans Radio broadcast for over 15 years. High quality printing services and warehouse distribution have been our hallmark since 1985, serving Fortune 100 companies for over 35 years. Check us out at www.dallascorp.com. CBN. Veterans Broadcast Network brings you Wounded But Not Broken, hosted by Patrick Scroggin. It lies within you to conquer your greatest challenges. Patrick tackles the stories of how others faced unthinkable odds and then at a pivotal moment, a change occurred within them that gave them the strength, attitude, and direction to excel beyond the greatest expectations. Listen every week and learn how it is possible to defeat the impossible. Welcome back to Wounded But Not Broken with host Patrick Scroggin. We're here with uh, Anthony and Manny Marquez. Uh, we're talking about a film that uh, Anthony's doing, and, and man, Anthony and Manny. Um, Anthony, what is the uh, like? What's the premise of the film, and kind of how is it going to roll? Um, so we we're actually supposed to be on the road filming right now, but um, some unforeseen circumstances happened, and we had to postpone that portion. But we're leaving in November to go on the road. Um, and we're going to be in an RV for about five weeks, and we're going to revisit all 17 of the Marines' uh, Gold Star families. And uh, we're going to get the stories from them because they're the ones who know the story best about their sons. So that's what this – the film is about the Marines, and uh, you know, so their stories aren't lost. Um, and then we're also going to be interviewing um, some of the Marines from my unit, 1st time, 5th Marines along the way as well. Um, and then uh, next, so next summer also we're going to try to be getting a carving, one of the carvings in the Marine Corps Museum um, in Quantico, Virginia. So it's it's just a lot of work, a lot of stuff going on. We have a, an event coming up on November 10th, like on the Marine Corps birthday, and then the very next day we leave on the the 11th for the actual road trip of start filming. Gotcha. So when you when, so I'm assuming, let me back up a little bit. I'm assuming like for you, this is kind of like, I mean, you've, it's, you've went above and beyond. I mean, you've taken it upon yourself to, you know, be selfless and, and, and sacrifice your life for the past few years to, to do this, which is super honorable. And, you know, I, I, I commend you for it. And, you know, I, I think we, a lot of us kind of learn a lot from, from what you've given up to, to make sure that families get some kind of closure. 
Um, but so t to me, this kind of sounds like this might be like the, 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 the closure for you. Once you get this done, then you can kind of move on and, and you feel like you've fulfilled, you know, what you set out to fulfill. Is that correct? Uh, yeah. I mean, it'll probably, obviously, like I said earlier, like, you know, this will always be a part of my life, but, and I'll probably still do carvings for other families as well. But this is, this is the way to like, for me to get the best way for me to get, um, like those stories for those Marines out there. And, um, and I want the families to know that like, you know, their, their loved one won't be forgotten, you know? Um, so I, I don't know if I'd really say it's like closing that chapter of my life, but cause it'll always be there. Um, yeah, I didn't, but, I didn't mean, I didn't mean closing the chapter. I mean, I know you're going to continue to do this for the rest of your life. I just mean with these 17 service members, they're always going to be with yeah. you, but, but you're going to kind of move on to, to yeah. a, a overall broader spectrum, right? Yeah, I can see it like that. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I don't, I don't foresee you. I mean, I know you, I don't, you're never going to, yeah. this is a part of our lives. We live it every day and we want to help everybody that we can help. And that's just, that's just who we are. And, uh, yeah. you know, I, uh, that's, that's why I wanted to do this podcast because stories like this, you know, I want to make sure they get out and, and I want to help as much as I can in my own way. You know, I mean, you're not, I'm not going to pick up a chainsaw and carve a wood. I'll probably cut my other leg off. So, but, uh, <laughs> um, so where are y'all going to, yeah, where will you start? Um, so we'll be leaving on November 11th in the RV, leaving Tulsa, Oklahoma, on, um, and we'll be going down to uh, the first Marines family that we're seeing. Uh, they live between San Antonio and Austin. He's buried at San Antonio, um, at Fort Sam Houston in San Antonio, but uh, we'll be going to uh, his family's house first, um, and then from there we'll also be visiting the graves because I have a Marine coming in from California that's going to be riding with us the first portion of the trip. And he's never been to John Fadius's grave. And so that's one reason I want to bring in other Marines that were, were there on that deployment, because I want them to be, to be part of this. They are part of the story, but I want their, them to help tell the story of the Marines that they know. And then also that the story they have to tell, you know, cause I don't, like I tell people, I, I don't, I didn't know all 17 of the Marines personally, you know, battalion's a big unit. There's over a thousand people in the battalion. So I didn't know every single one of the Marines personally, but so I want to bring in some of these other Marines who were in their fire team or they were, you know, they were in their squad and they, they knew them better. Um, so yeah, our first stop is going to be, uh, San Antonio area, and then from there we're going to go over to Louisiana, Florida, then we go up the West, East Coast, and we'll be uh, going into North Carolina, probably into Virginia. I don't, not sure if we're going to go into D.C. yet, um, and then we'll be over in the Maine, New York, Ohio, Minneapolis, Minnesota. Uh, there's two families near each other in Minneapolis uh, and St. Paul, Minnesota, and then we'll go over to Wyoming, Utah, and then back down to Colorado, and then we'll come back into Oklahoma, return the RV. Um, just a few days or around December 16th, and then we're home for the holidays, and then we go back on the road probably in January, February time frame, and we have four Gold Star families that are on the West Coast, uh, two in Washington State and two in California. And then once we're done wrapping up all that filming, we'll probably be filming a few Marines here and there that we missed, and then we'll be focusing on getting the uh, portion of the, um, the for the museum, for the display in the museum. So I have this idea that the museum – I want to display in the museum, and it would signify everybody who's been killed in the conflicts. Um, but I, I want to also – a piece of uh, dress blues uniform item from each 17 families um, to make a complete Marine Corps dress blue uniform, and each piece will be compiled of the 17 Marines. So one of the, the jacket – the blouse, the jacket will be one Marines. The cover will be another Marines. So the, the, the that uniform that will be displayed in the Marine Corps Museum with that carving – um, will be made up of all 17 of the, uh, you know, a piece of all their all their actual uniforms. Um, so that's next summer, and then after all that, then the film will go into a, like editing process. And Manny can t kind of talk into that more of that whole thing because I don't really understand all that. Yeah, well, so Manny, yeah. will this kind of be like a documentary style film? Yeah, it, it will definitely be a documentary because none of it will be made up. Um, you know, to me, documentary. A lot of what you see today is is very constructed, and and we did we did create a few devices. Like we got an RV because I said we get an RV and we'll go. That creates a device for us. A road trip. Everyone likes a road trip movie, right? Like that. 
you get in the road trip and now you're on the boat and you have to go downstream, you know? And so I thought that would right. be a good idea, but, but it is a documentary. We're not, we're not telling people what to say. We're not telling people what to do. And we're going to, you know, we might, we might stop along the way and meet Marines. We didn't even know we'd meet, but I do want to say something, Patrick, if I could, and Anthony hates when I say this, but you know, as much as it is about the 17 Marines, it's his story too. And he is such a humble guy and a modest guy. And it is his story of his sacrifice and the work he's done. And, you know, I, I myself, you know, we, we thought Anthony, we would have lose Anthony in Afghanistan. He got, was in a, in a blast um, a day after my son was born, my first child. And he called me from Camp Leatherneck and says, Hey, I almost got blown up yesterday. And I'm, so, you know, uh, as a person who didn't serve, um, I'm not, I'm not a veteran, but my brother is, my uncle was, and, and my grandfather's like, I have a, I have a mission to, tell these veteran stories the best I can. And I think I've done that with Operation Alley and, and 17 Carvings of the Short, but I've taken upon myself to serve in the way that I can by helping tell this story. And I think, um, you know, I think Anthony is a really good example of, of a, a, a good man that, that does good things for people. And we need more people like that. And I'm, I feel blessed to be able to tell that story. And so, yeah, it is a documentary. It means a lot to me, but I hope that, you know, and especially in America of today, and not to make it too political, that a lot of people don't see eye to eye on things, but a lot of us have had family members that served. And for the for the Gold Star families, they've lost family members. And I wish we could bring people around the table and, and see the hurt that these veterans have felt and the, the hurt these families have felt. And then for those that haven't served, to do your part to listen to veterans and give back a little bit. And that's what I hope I can do by spending the next year of my life basically making this movie with my brother, you know. So, yeah. Oh, that's, that's super awesome. And that's, you know, I, I, last week I had a, I had another Marine on that uh, got burnt really bad and, and he had a tremendous story as well. And, and, you know, every story is a great story. They're all different. They all have their own unique things. And, you know, yeah, there's, there's guys that are humble and I know Anthony's humble. Um, you know, I wouldn't try to push too much out of him, but I know, you know, I know what he's done and I know what he continues to do. And it's so honorable. And, you know, I salute you so much, Anthony, you're, you're a great man. And, and, um, you know, I, I think that that's, you know, that's, that's why this is the greatest country in the world is because we, we, we have people that are willing to lay their life on the line every day for the country, knowing what can happen and, you know, their families, uh, take the brunt into the sword when that when the ultimate sacrifice does happen, and I, I feel like a lot of a lot of people in the country uh, don't see it like that. And, and you know, stories like this and and these these short these documentary films like this, hopefully with people seeing them, will help them understand. And so, let, so with our list our listeners that we have, and and you know, how can we get the word out, and and uh, how can we how can we get involved? How can we help? You got a website or? Um, I can let that a little bit. This, yeah. yeah, so if if anybody's interested in getting involved, we currently have two ways um, to get involved. Um, we have a GoFundMe that that we've set up um, in the summer. It's you just go to GoFundMe, you know, dot com and look for XVII Films, uh, seventeen films. Um, we're we're taking donations on GoFundMe, and then for people that looking to do maybe if they want to get involved and donate to our film. Um, for tax exempt purposes, we have um, we have a deal with the um, Utah Film Commission, which is a documentary organization that we can take uh, 501c3 donations, and you get the tax tax deal with that. So if anybody's interested in that, they can contact us directly, and I, I can give you my email address if you want. Um, yeah, just, just go ahead and just cinema, say it if you don't mind. Yeah, it's cinema marquez at gmail dot com. So cinema like c i n e m a M A R Q U E Z cinema Marquez at gmail.com. And we can get you connected to, if you're interested in donating, you know, via the 501 C three. So we have two options. That's the way we're, we're doing it currently. And if you're just interested in being involved in any other way, you want to put us up if we're along your route or buy us dinner or buy us a beer or something, send me an email anyway, we'll look for you, <laughs> you know? No, that's that's awesome. I, I, you know, I hope I, you know, this, these are the things that I like to see people stand behind, and and uh, hopefully the listeners out there will uh, will get in touch with you. That's uh, that's that's super awesome. They can also uh, email me if you're having trouble at Patrick at VeteransRadioHour dot com, and uh, I can uh, I can help put you in touch too. Um, so. Yeah, man. Hi, Anthony. You're you're the man. I, you know, I'm humbled by what you're doing, and uh, Manning at you as well. 
uh, for you to give up your time to do this for your brother is it's awesome and uh you know you thank you all so much uh for getting you know doing what you're doing thank you yeah, i appreciate you having us on uh appreciate you having us on it was good to talk to you and kind of get the word out about set talking about the 17 marines and whatnot you know helping get their story out so that's what it's about for me so yeah, man, absolutely. And keep in touch on your travels. And if I'm near you, I'll come, I'll come and uh, we'll have a beer. All right. Yeah. Sounds All right, good. man. Thank you. All right. Yep. Take care. Thank you. Right. Bye-bye. See you. All right. This is uh, this is going to end the show tonight. You're going to, uh, you know, if, if you can help out them guys with that film, that would be awesome. Um, you know, this is a, it's for a good cause. And, and uh, you know, we got to stick together and, and help things like this get, uh, get through. So uh, just tune in next week. We're going to have another exciting story for you. Thanks for listening. Y'all have a good night. God bless you. God bless the United States of America. Thank you. You're listening to Wounded But Not Broken with host Patrick Scroggins. Attention. Looking for semi drivers nationwide. GTS Transportation of Burr Ridge, Illinois, is looking to hire a partner with experienced CDL holders in every state. If you are going to drive, why not drive for the best? Whether you are driving solo, as a team, or as an owner-operator, GTS is looking to add you to their rapidly growing company. Become part of one of the most respected, driver-friendly, and successful transportation companies in America, where drivers are treated as royalty. Contact us at gtscarrier.com. Again, gtscarrier.com. Or call us at 847-754-4667. That number again, 847-754-4667. We would love to help you, which in turn helps everyone. GTS is an equal opportunity employer. Corporation and Dallas Logistics, a proud supporter of the Veterans Radio broadcast for over 15 years. High quality printing services and warehouse distribution have been our hallmark since 1985, serving Fortune 100 companies for over 35 years. Check us out at www.dallascorp.com. CBN. Veterans Broadcast Network brings you Wounded But Not Broken, hosted by Patrick Scroggin. It lies within you to conquer your greatest challenges. Patrick tackles the stories of how others faced unthinkable odds and then at a pivotal moment, a change occurred within them that gave them the strength, attitude, and direction to excel beyond the greatest expectations. Listen every week and learn how it is possible to defeat the impossible. There is nothing wrong with your television set. Do not attempt to adjust the picture. We are controlling transmission. If we wish to make it louder, we will bring up the volume. If we wish to make it softer, we will tune it to a whisper. We will control the horizontal. We will control the vertical. We can roll the image. Make it flutter. We can change the focus to a soft blur. Or sharpen it to crystal clarity. For the next hour, sit quietly and we will control all the...